Hello, welcome back to episode 12 of Circle One. I'm your host, my name is John. My name is Ben. I'm Peter. Excellent. We're very excited to have Ben and Peter on for today's episode, episode 12 of Circle One. Uh, today we're going to talk about data-driven business or data-driven business as they may mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. correct me to. Uh, but first, a quick introduction to the show Circle One, the future of work and leadership. Uh, every week we'll be going live at the noon hour, central that is, uh, to discuss some big picture ideas uh, with regards to work and leadership. And so at our firm, Oxesis, uh, we help our clients with systems integration, uh, not only technology systems, but also creative systems and operational mm -hmm. systems. And uh, we've got a little bit of a thesis or a hunch, and that is the future of work includes more people who are their own boss, set their own hours, work from where they're from, on what they want, how they want. And uh, Peter and Ben, who join us today, I think are two wonderful examples of uh, that thesis uh, being realized, uh, both mm -hmm. uh, founding and running their own firms. Uh, and uh, so our goal on Circle One is to kind of take the best parts of traditional thinking when it comes to work and leadership, and then to also look forward to the future and try and integrate uh, some of the trends and ideas uh, that we see uh, a little bit further down the road. And so be both Ben and Peter have some, some awesome thoughts about the future of their industries, their careers, uh, and their working life. And so yeah, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ben. And Ben, I, I hope that uh, you'll be open to sharing with our viewers today a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, your organization, and your day-to-day. -day. Take it away, Ben. Okay, so hello everybody, and my name is Ben Isaacov. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, a business coaching firm, uh, Congruent Clarity. Me and my team, we help business owners to grow and scale up their businesses from good to great. And uh, we do it by coaching them to apply uh, a process approach and strategic thinking to what I call time, money, and team problems. And uh, what we want to do is to improve the bottom lines and also to improve the life and uh, work balances. So a little bit uh, why I wanted uh, to do this, I, I like to work with people. I really, really like when uh, I getting involved and I see the people, you know, my clients are getting better, things are starting to work better for them. I feel that this part of their success is my success. And that's why one of my motto is your uh, success is my story, right? I like to tell the story of success of my, my clients. Uh, I have a very strong background in uh, quality management systems and continuous improvement. I've been in operations and uh, being, a, being an ex-military for eight years in Air Forces, I know a little bit about discipline and leadership and how they supposed to work well together. And I try to apply all this to, to work with my clients. So pretty much uh, this is the top, top level overview of uh, what I do. Awesome. I hope you don't mind if I ask a couple questions uh, a little bit more about your background. In perusing LinkedIn and taking a look at your profile, you seem to be uh, holding a few very interesting certifications. Uh, could you maybe share a little bit uh, about that with us? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, mm -hmm. but I've never used my mechanical engineering to, to be an engineer. I applied it to, to understand processes. I work with the manufacturing sectors the most, uh, as well as, uh, you know what, I'm a lead, uh, I saw certification auditor. So I cert I'm, I've been certified to audit companies, uh, on under ISO. And you know, uh, failure and uh, failure and effect mock analysis and stuff like that. So these are the top levels again. Like uh, probably that's what you're researching, right? Yeah, I'm definitely very interested in the ISO uh, component, your experience mm -hmm. uh, and and your certification there. Um, it's yeah. Yep. So the, the you know what the ISO like my my take and uh, actually what I try to do is when people think about ISO, it's like scary and it is very dusty and bureaucracy and stuff like that it should not be like that and uh what i what i do is i convert it into something like a little bit more joy not joyful but alive and uh and again it's just a it's just a set of best practices that put all together into one into one uh, document right so if you apply it properly you you get it better 
Great. You made a joke at the top of the episode about uh, uh, maybe a bit of fear associated with data-driven business or data-driven bis- uh, uh. business decision-making. Um, do you feel the same way with regards to ISO? Like if you're speaking with a local manufacturing firm or service firm who's, who's considering ISO or pursuing ISO certification, mm-hmm. uh, I know in my experience when I look at it, I, I have a little bit of consternation that it's like, you know, behind a bit of a, a veil of complexity or secrecy or difficulty. Uh, is that uh, something that you help people uh, overcome and approach uh, with less Yeah, fear? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what? when when people are thinking about certification, they have these quality, quality assurance people that are speaking to them in very dry language, you know, customer requirements, feedbacks, and la la la, and all of this. And then they wrap it up with tons of very long and unreadable documents. And obviously, it is uh, frightening, right? But the point of I saw is that it needs to it needs to follow specific rules. You need to cover seven principles. And if you cover them properly, that's what you actually need to do as a business owner anyways. It just gives a structure and standardization to how, how and what you do. And, and once again, yeah, it's, it's hard to overcome the, overcome the first fear. But as soon as you're showing them, you know what, like a procedure, it's not like a 25 page document. It can be one pager with pictures and two sentences. And that mm-hmm. is a procedure, right? You just follow it. So when when there is a shift in, in mindset and people start to understand and look on it differently, then things starting to move faster. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks very much. Curious to see how we can uh, tie some of those ideas in with data-driven business. And now, uh, without further ado, on to Peter. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. and. Uh, I hope you might indulge our audiences uh, or our audience story with a little bit of the same, uh, uh, some info on your background, uh, your business and your day to day. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so I'm Peter Kerbel. I'm the owner of my company, Data Science and Consultants. We're a professional business intelligence firm that uses data to solve business problems. So I help a uh, couple of services, um, help people with uh, creating dashboards in Excel, help them clean up their Excel formulas. Uh, some people understand. Uh, don't understand what they need to collect for dashboards that they think they want and help them uh, figure out which what they need to track with some data uh, data science consulting and helping uh, people yeah uh, develop and enhance their dashboards they have like tableau or power bi uh because some people uh just kind of doing what they've always been doing and they don't um haven't thought of outside the box or have the uh deep analytical uh experience uh for that because yeah some people are, are scared of numbers uh, scared of formulas and I, I have a math and statistics degree so those are um, passions of mine so i'm very comfortable in that field so yeah it's very interesting uh people don't want to touch anything and so i can uh help them through that uh process so mm-hmm. uh, yeah awesome. so that's uh, yeah cool i'm a little also, bit also have, my, also have a minor in anthropology so i am interested in cultures and, and uh people and all that and it helps uh when i come into for clients uh their different offices because offices have cultures too like different departments or even just certain areas uh just the way people interact and talk and it helps yeah it's helped me uh get to know the different people in, in uh, a company then coming especially if we're changing a lot of processes or, or systems and everything like that to get to, to know someone and understand how it benefits them so it's not just for like the upper the ivory tower some people have some uh, resentment uh, help them understand how it uh, mm-hmm. helps me, you know, the front desk type of uh, employees and, and in the back or different managers. Uh, that, that's also important just because even if you introduce new technology, upgrade your systems, if people aren't using it, then, you know, you go for months with the uh, lagging behind. So Absolutely. I'm very interested in, in that combination of, of uh, training and, and education uh, that, that especially the, the anthropology degree brings. And I'm hoping we can, uh, again, tie that in a, a little bit later. Uh, but you mentioned a few kind of tools and words uh, in, in terms of like what you do in day to day. You talked a little bit about dashboards. You mentioned Tableau. You mentioned uh, Microsoft Power BI. Could you, from a high level, give us maybe just an overview of your toolkit, the types of tools that you're using on a day-to-day basis, and then you know how those tools turn into something that can be implemented in a business to to help them with with day-to-day operations. So. Yeah, yeah. The main uh, tools I use are Excel, 
Power BI and Tableau, I do some SQL that's a querying language that's mainly to extract the data from uh, your database and how it help. It, it depends on the situation, uh, like someone like, uh, let's say a warehouse manager wants to track which days the warehouse is busiest because they want to keep the employees busy um, or not and not over uh, worked. So if they know certain days are going to be busier, they can make sure they have uh, more staff that day and less staff another day so they can be on budget and still run uh, the warehouse efficiently. So that's one example. And that, that can be sometimes basically in Excel um, if that's solving uh, problems like that. Some places want uh, more, more dashboards, like uh, bigger companies, the owner wants to be able to easily see, track certain KPIs, certain metrics like every week. And then you might have like general manager needs, to, you know, daily updates of different information. They might need a couple of dashboards and, and Tableau is really good for that because it's a interactive dashboard. It's not like Excel is static. Like it, it just puts out, puts out the information. Tableau and Power BI, you can click on certain areas and it'll filter. Uh, so you can click on um, a salesperson and then it filters that like part of this uh, dashboard, could, like their, their average sales in a month for that week uh, and various things like that. So you can kind of do, uh, it's, it's data mining. It's most people think of data mining as like going on the internet, maybe web scraping or, or in their whole system, like a whole big analytical thing. But yeah, you can basically do some basic data mining, even, even just the uh, Tableau or Power BI dashboard. Just click, especially on a map, click on the map. Okay, here's our sales for that area and things like that. So that, that's how it can help uh, someone just wants to explore. And awesome. some good, uh, yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you are uh, doing a bit of a deep dive into the data that may exist within an organization, and you're using Excel or SQL, it sounds like, to do some of that work. Um, mm -hmm. But then at some point, and correct me if I've got this wrong, uh, it sounds like you're taking that data and making it usable, and is it Tableau or Power BI and the use of dashboards that... that helps you analyze the data, maybe present a story for, for the user so that they can then use that data that may be a little bit uh, uh, concerning with it, with regards to its complexity. I know when I look at all my data in its raw form, yeah. I get a little bit concerned. Um, but are, so are you saying that you use the dashboards, you use Tableau, which is interactive, you say, and Power yeah. BI to help yeah. represent that for real real world use? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a, a bit of Excel, yeah, especially Tableau and Power BI help uh, people understand all the numbers and all the data because most people don't like numbers like I do. So yeah, so it helps them just create some videos like different charts so they can easily see what's going on. They don't have to look at the numbers, uh, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah and potentially helping them uh, tell the uh, do the data storytelling so people awesome. can um, understand yeah what's going on in their business without having to understand any uh, numbers specifically and, and the data. So yeah, it's kind of yeah, do interpretation of the data. And all the calculations and, and metrics that you want to track, just helping it for anyone to understand. Great, especially great. Phones, you know some companies are specialized in your your field, whether you're selling or manufacturing, and you obviously um, not everyone uh, wants to know the details. So yeah, so just help them uh, make it, make it useful. Okay, I've got a couple questions, and uh, uh, they they might uh, be uh, directed at Peter, but I'm sure Ben, you might have some things to say about these questions. <laughs> Uh, so before we move into some of the topic discussion, there's two things that have really been capturing my attention uh, with regards to uh, the use of data in business mm -hmm. um, and maybe demystifying it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard a quote last week, uh, and Peter, maybe you can, can add some clarity here. Uh, I heard that uh, data is the uh, character's and data analytics is the plot. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, I've heard something like that before. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that sounds accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and then yeah, the, the dashboards or or data visualizations is kind of like reading it to people because for the story. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then the second one is um, in terms of data visualizations, we're we're throwing the word data visualizations. Uh, around and I get the the inclination that you're uh, you're describing different ways of viewing maybe more complicated data sets so simplifying data sets yeah. so that they can be viewed visually or maybe more intuitively is that correct yeah exactly yeah a lot more intuitive uh, for someone because Excel you can do uh, pivot tables people do um, yeah. 
So you can kind of see the columns and see them. It's still a lot of numbers. So mm -hmm. visualizations would be like creating the numbers into uh, bar charts, like so 50 and 100. So you can easily see, okay, this is half uh, or the different type of charts like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you don't have to know the numbers. You can just see, okay, this one's half as much as this one, or this is the biggest. Um, and then, the, you know, if you're more uh, tracking market share, sales, things like that, so you can just easily look at look at the chart, figure out what's going on, and kind of move on. You don't have to study it. You don't have to try to look at the numbers and try to, you know, do any calculations. Okay. Uh, it just helps you, uh, yeah, interpret so and view it. Yeah. I'm curious about diving into the visualizations a little bit. Maybe I can ask this one to both of you. Um, uh, I imagine that you both use data visualizations quite a bit. Uh, and I'm curious, what's your favorite method for visualizing data? And what's your least favorite method for visualizing data? And what, what types of methods would you advise that uh, maybe small business owners use when they're just starting to, to visualize their data? Okay, so you know what, like my, my personal preferred and my personal favorite one is the mind uh, mind maps because like uh, unlike um, unlike peter when he works with lots of data sets uh, i work with more more of a concepts and connections between the concepts and uh, mind maps are doing a great job of visualizing and showing the connections right so uh, to add a little bit you know what like i've heard that people you can divide people uh, by different uh, Microsoft products, right? <laughs> so for example, Peter is an Excel guy for sure, yeah. right? You probably is a PowerPoint guy and I'm, I'm in between, I think I'm a Word guy, right? Mm -hmm. So what Peter does is taking the Excel data as he, and he translates it to people in, in the PowerPoint uh, mindset, right? So he's visualizing it. So for me, like again, I try to visualize it as well because most of the people around us are PowerPoint people uh, and they need to see what, what you want to show them. So uh, it works well for me. The less, I don't know, I like I like all of them. I, I, use, uh, I use Excel a lot. I like to dive uh, into the data, but I will use the data sets, the raw data sets and, uh, you know, tables of data as of uh, less, um, Less favorite because this one is uh, less visual. And it's, again, mm -hmm. in my job, I need to have everything visual and you know, showing the results right away. So I, I think that's my take. Awesome, Peter. How about you? Uh, I like uh, Tableau, uh, depending on what the data set is, because you can uh, easily throw like if it's from Excel or uh, like I use a program in R and Python as well, so I can do some basic analytics to throw into Tableau and, and I can easily see, like I say, like different um, the metrics or whatever it's the analysis mm -hmm. and then explore a little bit there, do a little bit of data mining and then go deeper back into the programming and delve more. Okay, why, why is this one, you know, 1% everything else is over 50%, like you can kind of uh, go back into there. So that's why I like uh, uh, hopping into Tableau and, and it's good then if you yeah, have for the dashboards you can combine different worksheets and uh, people can easily um, click what they want because Power BI is a bit more. You have to know what you're looking for ahead of time. Typically, how it, they, they do a similar things, but coming from totally different perspectives. Uh, Power BI and Tableau. So uh, Power BI has its uses, but for me, usually when I'm exploring the data, uh, I like Tableau. Okay. And, uh, just, uh, just doing different charts, different yeah, looking at different ways, like um, and seeing what uh, what, uh, what what's revealed, <laughs> I guess. Awesome, awesome. So I've been very curious about Tableau for some time, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very curious uh, about working with you maybe a little bit more to uncover the power of, of tools like uh, Tableau. Uh, but I've heard you also say something interesting about specific types of data, data visualization, charts, uh, for example. Um, yeah. And I've, oh. I've heard you exalt the uh, usefulness of the bar chart, and I've also yeah. heard you deride the usefulness of the pie chart. Why? Are pie charts not good ways of visualizing data, Peter? Uh, that, that's, uh, it's, it's because of actual scientific studies. It's not necessarily opinions. So some people have strong opinions. They uh, champion not to use pie charts. Uh, one of the problems with pie charts and, and donut charts are even worse. Donut charts are like pie charts, the whole missing. Uh, because humans can't um, relate uh, area as much. Like a bar chart is just one line. 
and you can easily compare them. But like a pie chart is um, is a whole area, and humans just can't understand that. So because those those type of charts are usually used for comparison, like comparing different groups, and yeah, pie charts just can't use uh, uh, can easily understand what's going on. And like pie charts are really good when you have one group is over fifty percent of the others, and you only have like maybe four groups because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll see in pie charts there's one they're like little slivers and they have to have like an arrow pointing what it is that's that's kind of useless like so you'd have to like ideally group them together saying okay this is other um but yeah so that's what pie charts can be good like when you want, i want to emphasize okay this is over 50 percent compared to all these other groups uh just because you can you don't have to under, you don't have to compare the to the different uh, areas you just know okay this one's bigger but if you want to go any any deeper, uh, it, it's uh, it, it takes more energy and people don't even understand and, and uh, you can't uh, actually sometimes um, realize what what you're looking at and that, that's why uh, pie charts and, and donut charts are uh, aren't useful and that's yeah and some people use them for like if you have a presentation and you know what the data is you can use pie chart potentially but yeah if you're using it on a dashboard or a, 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 anything that you're not analyzing you don't know what's coming up it's uh it's very inefficient like you waste your time mm -hmm. and lots of energy that's why people have this aversion uh, uh against charts and some of them is partially because they're designed uh poorly and so it wastes your energy and you get bored and get tired especially presentations uh instead of and so and they're distracting from what the person's saying so that's uh, the visualization theory is in a new field where people are trying to um, make charts more time and energy efficient very cool very very cool um, I have one last question before we get into the topics. Okay. I am wondering if I'm a business owner and I'm realizing that while on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm relying more and more on technology and I'm generating more and more data in my business. And let's say I start to develop the suspicion that if I were to really grapple with this data, you know, sort through it, wrangle it, start to do something with it. If I were to try and take my kind of inert data and try and use it to help me make better decisions. Uh, you've painted a picture of kind of implementation with the visualizations, the dashboards, Tableau. Uh, what might the components of you know that simplification look like? If let's say I were a professional services firm, mm -hmm. and I wanted a dashboard that was going to track or, or visualize for me some of uh, the indicators that my business was on the right track or the wrong track, or maybe some indicators that might help me decide you know, what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, what might some of those data points or charts or or indicators represent business-wise? It all, it's, it's like a complicated question actually, but it all depends on the, on your goals. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, like what do you, like, you know, data mining is uh, interesting. It is fast. It can be very fascinating because you start to get into trends. You connect the dots and everything. And Peter can can expand on it forever, I think. But at the end of the day, like when you mine the data, you have to uh, analyze it and you have to get a value from it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you are talking about your say service provider, uh, what is important for you? If you are tracking your billable time, so that is going to be your uh, indicator, right? billable versus unbillable, so if it is important. Or if you don't care about it, you have plenty of time, so maybe how many hours you are spending with your customers. It all depends, and, and my personal um, opinion is that it's, uh, it needs to go from top down when you have your strategy and you start to define what are the, what are the directions that you are taking your business to and what are the strategies that you are implementing. So. What you do with uh, with KPIs, that is the bottom line. It's kind of a defense uh, line when you prove or unprove your strategy, and then you can base your improvements of this line. But that's pretty much the benchmark. If you think about it as a benchmark, then then you start to choose better uh, better data that you analyze. Because again, you can analyze it from from today until uh, until the end of the world, and you'll get so much data that you know, you'll get into insights that you don't really need. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me, t let me, let me see if I've got this correct then. So it sounds like you're saying top down, uh, start with strategy. So you've got, you know, um, some organizational motivated goals. Uh, you've got some high level object objectives that you, mm -hmm. you want to be in pursuit of. And so the development of maybe some indicators or some KPIs that you uh, would like to represent, 
or to keep right. track of or to monitor on a day-to-day -day basis should be driven from the top down as opposed to grabbing all your data and then trying to figure out you know mm -hmm. what those indicators should be or where you should go just based on the data solely mm -hmm. well yeah awesome. sure yeah. Uh, you know what i've seen it uh, i've seen it many many times when uh, and you know especially when you are in qa uh, field you'll be able to again and when you visit companies you will see this uh, you know huddle boards with these uh, charts and stuff like that that is uh, posted over there and nobody looks on them because they are irrelevant or they just don't know what are they but it's still collected because why you need it like for some unknown reason uh, instead my approach is don't have too many graphs don't have too many kpis because then you will be unfocused focus on what is really important to you right now right and how can you know it's like a subject for itself for another hour i can i, I can expand mm -hmm. it but <laughs> you, again you start from your why you start from why you do your business this is the way that you do it right and what where do you want to get it? so you establish your baseline and from there you go you cannot do it you cannot do it on the bottom level like just starting collecting the data hmm. it's like it's i think it is pretty useless yeah well you're starting to uh uh lower the veil for me i'm feeling less and less consternated about the prospect of using data to drive decisions in my business mm -hmm. um and you know, when, when I in my business am looking out there for assistance, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, uh, some some experts in certain fields, but even trying to figure out what fields or what skill sets to put together is also what, what uh, maybe fills me with a little bit of anxiety, right? I want to know that I'm putting the right specialists together to, to really, you know, maximize my potential and at the same time minimize my downside. Um, yeah. And so it, it seems like the two of you are very complementary, if I'm not mistaken. So if I've understood correctly, Ben, you help very much with the top level, with the strategic planning, with orienting around the why. And that to me is like, oh, I could probably figure out a way to build some dashboards based around that if I'm kind of removing the noise and focusing on the signal. And then on the same uh, token, if I am scared about the dashboards and the data analysis and the wrangling and mining and all the rest of that stuff, Peter, would you be the, a great person to turn to for assistance with that as well? Yeah, yeah, I can help. Yeah, help you understand the data and 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 also do uh, like reiterations. Like after you know, like three six months, if certain things we're tracking, it's yeah, it's irrelevant to the company. You can stop tracking those and maybe track some other things. Uh, it can be like an ongoing bit of an ongoing process, like continuous improvement, which is uh, one of Ben's expertise. <laughs> so awesome. yeah, there yeah, there's a lot of uh, yeah with dashboards. Like it's not always one uh, like one off like just create it, it sometimes it, it, it could be a larger project where we want to make sure we track a couple and see which ones are relevant uh, to your business and then you can see like uh like yeah for some relevant ones if if your company's growing uh, can, how much can your company grow and see how is it still you know have a good profit percent ratio and hiring new people will this help and things like that so I there's think a, lot that's of, a lot of factors yeah, that's a big one and and yeah. i think both in manufacturing or, or product-based yeah. businesses and service yeah. businesses yeah. i always talk at oxesis about uh one of the biggest fears especially for a small or micro business a boutique firm is when yeah. when to hire that next person and then even yeah. after you hire that next person feeling yeah. like oh is there uh, you know does reality like, support the decision to to actually hire that, yeah. that person yeah right? just just because business is growing do you like some places have the uh especially manufacturing they have to have the actual building so do we buy a bigger building twice as big like can we do we have enough profitability without like where we still be the same profit or or how do we mo modify the one we have like there's yeah a lot of uh those type of things or yeah accounting firms or anything else that's expanding or yeah other boutique firms do we want a bigger office uh, yeah we'll hire 10 more people will we be percentage wise, then we're profitable or is only like at five, is that where we're kind of peaking, you know, in, in your field, right? Like or your city or region, whatever. Yeah. So there's, yeah, that's a huge concern. That's where like a lot of the clients have, they're in that point where they're kind of growing and they want to make sure they don't grow too much and then mm -hmm. like, simple, or, awesome. uh, or they don't want to miss the opportunity, right? Cause they don't want to leave money on the table. Like, well, we could have been making, you know, an extra, whatever thousands of dollars a day or months if we had expanded or so. Great. Okay, so it sounds like we've got a wonderful picture painted of 
the value of using data in the business. Uh, and I'm feeling much more at ease thinking about this and how I might leverage uh, you know, the skill sets or different areas of expertise in my business. And we're talking about real business decisions. All of a sudden, it's demystified, helping yeah. me f- figure out when to get new uh, premises or invest in PPE, property, plant, and equipment. Uh, it's funny nowadays, there's two PPEs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when to hire, you know, how to hire, you know, these types of things. Um, and we've also painted a little bit of a picture in terms of where you uh, as individuals and as service providers, your firms overlap and, and maybe complement each other. And you guys have an interesting story. And so I'd like to ask you guys, how and why did data bring you two together? And, and maybe I'll turn it over to Ben here to, to tell me and the audience a little bit of the story about uh, how you guys realized uh, how complementary you are. Oh, that's that's is actually like a very nice story that uh, that I, I love to tell. So uh, I always search for a collaboration with other people because I truly believe that one plus one is three when you apply it properly. And I look around and see specialists. So uh, Peter was standing up like, uh, you know what, his uh, way of doing the, the production, like the marketing production stood up to me. And I was very curious about like, you know, the personality because there was a, so such a big cognitive dissonance in between what he's saying and how he's saying and what he's showing. So I decided to reach out. So I said, okay, like, you know what? Uh, I've seen your ad, this is who am I, let's talk. And uh, we had a conversation, there was a click and because again, like you said, we complement each other and uh, there are like very, very much overlapping in our personalities. We both like data we both like analysis and we, we, we do stuff similar in this way. So I said, uh, you know what, how about we do something together? Like it's, you know, like mm-hmm. we will help each other. And this is uh, where we started to roll it. So we were thinking what we we're going to do. And, uh, and actually we came up with an idea of um, getting like a series of, uh, of webinars about data and how it is important in, in a business and how, and how small businesses can benefit from it. So we've launched it already and we already had one uh, pretty successful uh, webinar already. So uh, we, we will start working on second uh, later. But anyways, that's, that's exactly the point. Like when, when you've noticed the, the combination, I, I like to say that we are like a um, team of snipers, right? There is always a sniper and there is always a spotter. Uh, mining the data is an art. Like, you know what, you getting overwhelmed with so much information, right? So in, in, in my view, I will see the picture, right? And I will spot it and I'll say, I need to know if we are on time with delivery for Mondays for people that paid on time, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I want. Like, yeah. that is important to me. Like, go figure it out. People like Peter and like Peter is, you know, specializing on that. He will go, he will mine, and he will take all of the noise out, and he will give me a clear data with graphs showing, okay, this is how many, this is how many like times you are on time for this specific group, right? And meeting all the requirements, and I'll use it, and uh, and that that's where we can team up actually, and this is when uh, we are planning to meet to team up whenever I have some data sets that I am not willing to work by myself because it is too complicated i will i will uh, turn it over to peter when he will uh, you know do his magic and he will uh, and he will extract the data and he will you know draw a nice picture and by the way thanks for the for the pie chart i didn't know about that <laughs> because you know, i always Me felt neither. that i need to put the numbers like you know numbers uh, around it yeah. to make it better but now yeah. i understand why yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where uh, more information isn't always better. Like, yeah, you, like get rid of this, the noise, right? You just, yeah. Well, it was it was funny. Peter Peter came by our offices and I showed him some of our dashboards uh, and some <laughs> yeah. of our data analysis, and we had pie charts. Not a ton, but some pie yeah. charts. And he told me, <laughs> and as soon as he said it, you know, I looked at it and thought you're totally right like it's it's way more difficult to to compare surface area than it is to compare the single dimension of yeah of you know height of a bar in a bar chart right so that was fascinating i'm i'm really curious too about 
uh, the webinar. Uh, I was fortunate enough to attend for a little bit. And by the way, hats off to you guys. Uh, you guys did a phenomenal job. But it's a weird phenomena. We've always seen co-marketing to a certain extent. Um, but there's a degree of collaboration that I'm noticing, especially amongst uh, entrepreneurs and you know service firm founders, boutique firms, and all the rest of it. And I think traditionally, um, the service firms and especially the boutique or maybe specialist service firms have seen even complementary services uh, through through a little bit of a lens of fear, you know, not wanting right. to 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 cleave off market share or, or clientele to to right. complementary folks. And now with new media, with the way that you know business and services are being delivered with this online conversation uh, and just more opportunities to collaborate, uh, it seems absolutely fascinating to find that you two guys got together and produced a webinar together. I don't know if I'd quite seen something like that, at least in Winnipeg or in Manitoba with the service providers. Um, and so maybe Peter, you can, can share a little bit about why that was so beneficial from the production side um, yeah. and maybe how you guys viewed it as, as complementary rather than, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a zero sum game, but it's, uh, you know, it's, oh, yeah. no, it's not more for all, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think, uh, well, to add to what Ben was saying, when we were connecting also, we're, uh, very much, uh, business uh, oriented, like helping businesses, like mm -hmm. uh, some people might my field of uh, math and analytics and stuff like that they're into the like i am into the numbers and, and all that don't always see uh the bigger picture how with the uh how it benefits like a company like if someone's especially if someone's in mainly into research talk to a lot of people in machine learning and they're just into the, a lot of the research not always how it benefits the business uh so i think that's a big aspect uh why ben and i clicked so much is that uh run your own businesses or I, i've worked closely with uh other businesses i've worked before when I uh, was doing more analytics with the CFO, COOs, and it's always like, well, how does that help us? And they're, they're questions, and I started to, started to understand why they're asking me to do certain things. And I think that's a big part where um, other companies, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't like other firms, like if they're specialized in certain things, yeah, they might not, uh, they might, yeah, worry um, that the company, uh, like if they collaborate, you know, with a with, for a client, the client might just go with the other company instead of them, depending on I guess the uh, their specialty. But I, I think for Ben and I, it was just, uh, uh, we can uh, yeah, because we're focused on the business, we understand how businesses work, what they need, and to, to expand them. So we have both like similar visions. So I think that's one of the reasons why help where other companies might people come to that, any clients come to them and to help them, they might not fully understand the big uh, picture and driving force and, and with Ben and I, yeah, we can, uh, don't have much, I think, I think it's also one of these, um, uh, yeah, maybe a misconception or, or just because people understand, um, our field. It, I, like I've talked to some people, it's kind of like, uh, building a house. You need a roofer, you need basement person, glass, doors, stairs. There's tons of, uh, regulations with stairs, like all these different things. So you, I mean, you can have big companies, uh, like in my area, it'd be like Deloitte would kind of be like kind of my competition. <laughs> but yeah, you can have a big yeah. construction company come in and have people that do that. They sometimes might, you know, uh, contract some of those parts out. But some people, they just hear data or like they think Ben and I are competing or or digital marketing people think uh, they're competing uh, with me. Or some people think they're competing or, or uh, uh, data security, things like that. And not realizing, well, no, it's like I, if I'm doing the roof, they do the doors someone else does the, the lawn and, and uh, the plumbing heating like there's so many aspects and i think it's yeah people just don't understand uh data because it's new and it's complicated and yeah there's lots of fear technology and, and numbers uh formulas so i think that's part of it is that uh, there's a lot less uh, competition in our industries but people don't understand it and if they're less uh, if they're very focused on their own aspects like just because digital marketing like, people I always when i mention what i do or my name my company most people think I do digital marketing and they're sort of asking that or, or they do digital marketing and they only think of analyzing their digital marketing, not other parts mm. of the business. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's part of the reason, um, because yeah, Ben and I have more niche, uh, 
areas. So I think that's uh, it, it's it's an interesting uh, education part of talking with people and start when they start to click and understand. Oh, okay, this is what I do, what I can do, what I don't do. I don't do cybersecurity. Some people come to me. So I met someone and their laptop, a camera, what have it, it, it froze or crashed, and they they emailed me like, what do I do? I'm like, I, I can't do anything. Here's a company I know. Uh, and I give them contact information for a specialist in that area. I, I can't retrieve your data, but I can analyze it. So awesome. uh, I, th I think I think that's uh, I, and I think yeah, companies are yeah. I don't know why there's less co collaboration. That's interesting. I think yeah, there just might not. Um, some people aren't open. So yeah, there's the uh, yeah. I guess worried that they might they don't understand the overlap or, or um, yeah. I guess there's a lot of competition in certain areas. And so if there's a is opportunity to collaborate, they might not see it, and uh, or they want to. Some places want to do so much on their own. So, I don't well, know. I have a, I have a little bit of a theory, and and you know maybe a, a, a hypothesis about the future, uh, and maybe you guys can indulge me for a moment. Um, I'll start with data science or, or or the field of data science. It's a rather new field. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. How old would you say, Peter? Uh, well, I think the term data science is maybe five years old, maybe 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 ten, but yeah. the actual like, because it's an umbrella term, and even like the definitions like they're uh, starting to kind of get a consensus. Last year or two, someone like uh, I talked to a lot of data scientists or people that feel so like there's data engineering, analytics, visuals. It's an umbrella term, yeah. So it is very new, and, and so yeah. So it's Start. it's quite new. I think there's. Uh, a trend in in education. I know the universities are falling all over themselves to try and launch <laughs> data science programs right mm -hmm. now, and then combine yeah. that with our current environment. It's a very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, and I, I also have done a little bit of research on data science in terms of the industry and the market, the competitive fork it, uh, sorry, the competitive forces, uh, and actually the the market growth. And I think the last uh, the last research project I did was about six months ago. Uh, and, and kind of the numbers I uncovered uh, were to the effect of the, the industry or field of data science seeing between, and it's, it's loose and it's loosely defined, but seeing yeah. between a 29% CAGR compound annual growth rate and a 39% compound annual growth rate, which for any industry is insane. Like that's wild, right? To see that yeah. much uh, projected growth and even historical growth on the, on the past few years uh, is absolutely wild. So my theory is, it's so new, it's growing so rapidly um, that, it, you know, people in situations like that tend to keep their cards yeah. close, right? right. Um, and I think that's what was inspiring about you guys when I, when I first met you and attended the, the webinar. It was like, here are two brave guys, they're bold, they're collaborating, they're doing this co-marketing thing together. And that also is, is near and dear to, to me here at Oxesis and uh, something that we're really trying to pursue is yeah. with everything happening in the world, you know, externally, internally, the tools, the technology, uh, you yeah. know, the, the socio-political environment, whatever you want to say, uh, it seems like there's just way more options and way more things to be scared of. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I think we're just hopeful over here at Oxesis that we see more collaboration in good faith, especially between small key players, because obviously we've got the Giants and like yeah. you said, Peter, Deloitte's your direct competitor, which is can be yeah. scary. It's like, how else do independents, boutique firms, you know, uh, uh, smaller uh, service organizations contend? And collaboration, being brave, and linking up skill sets seems to be one of the ways forward to me. So hats off to you guys for, for showing uh, the rest of us that that can be effective. I'm, I'm so inspired by that. All right, moving along, we've got a couple other topics. I'm very curious uh, uh, to ask you guys about this. Um, we discussed uh, yesterday a little bit uh, of a paradox, and uh, I'm maybe going to ask Ben about this one first a little bit. I was alluding to it in, in the, the last little bit of, of talk. With everything at our disposal, at our fingertips, all of these new tools, it can be scary. It seems to me that there's this paradox present that we're, we can be fearful of technology or deride technology or deride reliance on technology. Uh, and yet at the same time, we're standing on top of technology while at the same time admonishing it. So there seems to be a bit of a paradox here. Do you, do you see that in your work? 
spend? Do you, do you find that there's ways to navigate that concern that are more effective? Um, and I guess, do you even agree with the premise that there is that paradox at play? No. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know what? The, the, the reason is pretty simple, I think, right? So the why people are holding to the old ways of doing things because I know that they were working and it, you know, they used to have it like, you know, like I was driving a truck, like my dad was driving a truck, I'm driving a truck, my son will drive a truck, right? No, with, nobody thinks about it. It's just mm -hmm. a situation. And like you said, when we have uh, all of the information on, 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 on the palm of our hands, so the know-how and the skills are expanding and, you know, getting out there so fast that you cannot allow yourself to uh, to do the, the things that you were doing it you know in the previous uh, previous generation even right or like 10 years ago and yeah and i see i, I see it all the time because uh, business owners will do something in a certain way because a you know what they they afraid of something new they don't know how to predict it so if they use a piece of equipment that breaks every friday for two hours okay <laughs> so they know this piece of equipment breaks every friday two hours they know how to fix it they keep it running you know it's it's a known problem and it is okay with them like you know what and then if you introduce an uh, an idea of maybe and you know maybe this machine is not doing good maybe if you replace it with a more expensive one yes you will spend more money in your resources but here how you can uh, compensate on that right they they need to understand that and uh, one other thing like we've men we've spoke about it yesterday we as humans like i told you right we usually develop new things uh prehistorically i think all of our tools you know we invented the tools before to kill other animals for for food and then accidentally we started to use the tools to do the job right so it, it was not vice versa and uh, there is always there is always a, a fear of something new that is being introduced, uh, and uh, it, sometimes it's pretty easy to overcome. Sometimes it's pretty easy to overcome because there is some other player, a bigger player that's already doing that, mm -hmm. and they are succeeding. And this is actually what I use. That was that was one of my reasons why I do what I do, because I've seen I've seen better practices applied in a corporate. And I show them, okay, they can do it, you can do it too. This is how much cost you to not do it. And then, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, and then the perspective is yeah. changing. Yeah. So I'm really curious about that from your, especially maybe from your ISO audit uh, background. Uh, I imagine that you've seen in many businesses the argument put forth of, Here's what those with maybe those standard operating procedures, those formal processes that focus on quality assurance and total quality management. Here's what the ones that, you know, maybe go through the process to, to get there are mm -hmm. able to unlock in terms of potential upside. And so are, are you able to? It's, you know what, like I, I like um, when I'm getting into this situation when there is some procedure in place and people do something in a certain way, um, <clears throat> very often people don't really question why why they do it this way uh, probably peter can relay when he was uh, working with some companies and they do something in a certain way because back then they didn't have an excel so they had to do it manually mm -hmm. and now what they try to do they try to do this manual process automatically c copying it one to one in there killing completely the efficiency and two stories that I like is one of them with the monkeys I've mentioned yesterday. But my my favorite one is actually the connection between a horse butt and a space shuttle uh, uh, solid fuel uh, boosters. And uh, and when you mentioned that, you know, how can they be connected? And it is very simple. So when uh, the engineers were designing the, the rocket boosters, they were producing them in Utah. In general, it needs to be wider. It needs to be bigger, right? But they were, they were constrained with a train that going through a tunnel. So the size of the booster is constrained with a tunnel, which in a, in, in a sense was, you know, built around the standard cart, like, you know, train cart. And the train cart was built around a standard gauge, the width 
of the of the rails, right? This one is coming from UK. We adopted the UK standard, right? And this standard, this standard was actually coming from uh, from the old uh, old manufacturing of the you know uh, wagons, you know horse wagons, and there was like a specific width of the wheels that can fit and not break in the old roads built by Roms. <laughs> and they were forcing everybody to use a specific width of the wheels because this is what they were using in the uh, chariots, right? The war chariots. Right. And the width of the war chariot is pretty much tied up into the width of the rear end of the horse. So, and you know what? If you trace this chain up, from the horse butt to, to the rocket booster, you understand that there is a constraint that you put into your system. And the why and the reason is so obsolete that you know what, and, 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 and I could see, I've seen it so many times when people do something, they replicate process after process, basing on something that is so obsolete, so not working anymore, right? You just click on a button and it's working and they're like, wow like you know like <laughs> you've saved us you know 350 percent of our time right now like yes. you know, with this thing, right yes huh fascinating uh i'm curious to hear uh some of peter's thoughts on this as well i love that idea of of uncovering that link between the way things once were done and the way things are done right. today because once you don't notice it with the solid rocket boosters you just don't yeah. think about it and then all of a sudden somebody points it out and you go wait a second, hold on, right? I, I think about it, I was watching the show Snowpiercer with my, my girlfriend the other night, and the train is tall and only so wide, right? The tracks are, are this wide, and there's something goes wrong with the train, and it's like top heavy, and it's tilting over. I don't know, I'm sure trains in, in reality are pretty bottom heavy, but I wonder, like, why aren't the train tracks wider? Why aren't the rocket yeah. boosters a, a, a larger circumference, right? And it's all tied to the way things were done hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, right? Yeah. So Peter, you, you had a few very interesting things to point out with regards to maybe that blindness of the link uh, between the way oh. things are done today and the way things are done uh, before. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I've, yeah, different companies and stuff like that. People are like, trying to, yeah, trying to be more efficient or, or, or just different procedures and they're like, this like it's very much yeah i guess almost based on fear it's like i i know how to i know where i know these fields to click into and what information i need to put in there and so they don't want to do anything different and they're very scared uh some people are scared of learning just new procedures and then or for um worker companies were upgrading their uh or like your cm system or erp like different programs and then it's like oh now the fields are different or or di uh, different places and, and people are asking like, well, where's this? What about this thing? It's like, well, we don't need to do that anymore. The, the, the system already mm. calculates that for us. Uh, or like dates, sometimes now they're automatic. Or, or it can pull in information. You type in like your, your uh, client's name and it pulls in the information. You don't need to do it manually every time like it's used to do. Or a lot of people I've worked with, they felt they could do faster writing everything down. So they, they're just like, you know, a couple years ago, they want to get rid of their computer on their desk. They just want to write everything down. And uh, yeah, it's because that's what they're used to. And mm -hmm. they don't understand how it might make them, it might make them a bit faster, but then especially like in a sales, of uh, someone who's uh, depending on commission, it might make you somewhat faster or you think it can be faster, but then it takes longer for auditing and then, then the, yes. your finance department, everything to, to process, if you have to do everything by slips and you get paid slower, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's uh, sometimes there's that uh, type of effect. Uh, yeah, I've worked with yeah some people uh, just oh we've always done it this way and then yeah. or even Excel like I yeah like I've mentioned like I see some Excel sheets and formulas they're just trying to figure out what they're doing and it's like well you could do this and then it'd be like saves them like an hour every day and they just didn't know and they didn't have the time to yeah I think that's some people yeah the, between the think they don't have the time or the um, potentially the vision like I worked at uh, for a summer I worked at a place and they they had a process they uh, printed off paper uh, on the spools with so there's extra fields and we had to I, th I think it was print stuff off copy them and then rescan it so they could email 
and I just found like different ways. I, I turned the papers the other way, and then say, then they could just scan them. They'd have to print it out. So I saved them like hundreds of papers every day, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, they just never thought of it. They don't have the time to think of that. It's like, it's, you know, and, and and not that they didn't, but yeah, because they're busy, and that that's um, and, and they might not, because I was just a summer student, so I could, whatever I could try, and if it failed, it's <laughs> it's no real backlash to me. I think that's where some companies if a bit leeway with. Uh, with people or just give, give them the time to think of uh, different ways of doing things or just, yeah, sometimes the vision of, you know, like, yeah, just they, because a lot of them just got stuck. Oh, this is our procedure and I cut out two steps and hundreds of papers a year. Uh, yeah, days. you compound that over over the year or the yeah, you know, yeah. over it's a like, quarter and it really adds up, yeah, right? Yeah, you, right. If, if you spend an hour testing and uh, maybe you waste some paper because you do it wrong and different things. But yeah, after a couple months, I'm sure the company will save time, but and you, had, so you had something really funny to point out. You, you pointed out a few things that really helped, like, for me, lower the veil. Uh, technology does fill me with anxiety oh. to a, a certain degree. Um, and, and you pointed it out in a way that really, I, I think, just showed it for what it is. And I try to tell myself technology is just a tool. It's not really about the computer or the whatever. It's, it's about what we're able to achieve with it. Um, mm. And when you start to think about technology as just a tool or uh, you know something that that processes uh, an input into an output uh, for example you 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 told a funny little story about social media and technology reliance i hear all the time oh you're addicted to technology what yeah. was your what was your comment uh, oh uh, like I, I i think it was um when i go grocery shopping i usually have my phone cause that's where i keep my, my grocery list or even the, even the parking lot i'm you know checking text or whatever I sometimes get weird looks from people, uh, especially older people, and it's, or it's just in general, we have this idea like, oh, like I see so many memes or so many jokes about people looking at their phone, but it's weird, like they're they're posting it on Facebook. <laughs> so they're already on a computer themselves, whatever age you are. Like there's people like on, on social media, like all these different generations, and, and or you mean on the street, people like, oh, look, they're walking down the street, looking at their phone, like they're obsessed with technology, but they're walking on paved roads, wearing, you know, shoes, typically socks, clothes, like, Buttons, zippers, those are all technology. Like it's not all electricity based. A lot of people think technology is, has to do with electricity, something you plug in. We don't forget Velcro was created in the 1950s. Like that's technology, but we don't, people don't always want to think that or how you sew, like sewing machines have advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, basic things like that or doorknobs are like 100, less than 200 years old, I'm pretty sure. Wow. Uh, so that's why people, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, yeah. So, yeah, so that's the basic. I think that's the thing is anything that, um, is invented or becomes popular after you're born you think is new technology you don't realize like matches and, and lighters those are like 100 made i think lighters came first because matches are actually more complicated to make and that's technology we don't think of that mm -hmm. per se or glasses and hmm. my vocals uh yeah so i think that's uh, i find it funny yeah people afraid of new technology not realizing like the millions of old technology we use they, even just like the research and science like dentistry, like, yeah, mm -hmm. clipping my nails. I Nail wonder. Fall. Those are all like, they have to be manufactured and, and like quality control and the right sharpness. Uh, and even the benefits of certain things like flossing, brushing your teeth, different health things that we don't uh, realize is like, there's a lot of technology science behind it. It's, I, I find it interesting or sometimes frustrating when people complain the newest technology. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, w I wonder if maybe 2,500 years ago or so there was. Uh, you know, a business selling wi widgets in in Egypt, and they yeah. tallied their inventory on a rock with a with a with a with another rock. And a consultant came along and said, "Guys, this paper's been around for five years. Why aren't you using this paper? It's so good. Here's a pen. Here's a paper." And yeah. the you know the the rock tallier was like, "Oh, the technology scares me. You're just trying to." I'm reliable. <laughs> well, yeah, they used to. I think uh, she shepherds back in the day would would. Uh... They would, know, they, they would have like a, a sack of rocks, like 16 rocks that they have 16 sheep that have 16 rocks. So when they count the sheep, they put the rocks in the, into the, into the bag or out, right? That, that, that was their accounting system like yeah. a thousand years ago. So yeah. And, and yeah, did someone come along with a piece of paper? <laughs> so like once you that. lower the veil, it's all really tools yeah. and different ways of essentially doing the same stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For, yeah, for that. generations, right? Just, yeah. yeah. But just better. Like it's again, you know what, like, Talking about technology, when when Peter was talking right now uh, about technology around us, I'm coming from uh, from ag as well, like one mm -hmm. of the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. and, 
when I just started with ag uh, in Canada, I started to realize how much technology, new technology is in this field. You will say like a farmer, right? Like I am a simple farmer, you know, but they do things, they calculate stuff, like, you know, like how many centimeters in between one yeah. seat to another to this point and like, like how deep it is. And it is very precise. And I was amazed. I was amazed like with the nowadays technology and another fact that I didn't know, like, you know, we all talk about Tesla, right? And autopilot and stuff like that. Autopilots uh, in ag are existing yeah. for maybe like, I don't know, 10 years. Yeah. When, the, when the tractor will use like, you know, optimized by computer truck and it will follow it all by itself. Like, it's like, yeah. you know, Tesla, come on, like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But it also with egg too, weather, like weather forecasting. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's improved. And then so they can do more things and the seeds themselves, like the, you know, uh, splicing and whatnot. Yeah, there's so much. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, I agree with you, John. Uh, coming back to like to, to small business owners, right? Mm -hmm. When we were speaking about the, about the technology and the, and the reason why they need it, the world becomes so much competitive once again, because, you know, if you was possessing the know-how 20 years ago, you have no competitors. You do it a specific way, that's it. Today, somebody does something in three weeks. First of all, China will replicate it in three weeks, and then in six weeks, it's landing your market. But then your competitors will do the same, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need to use every possible advantage that you can just to stay on the same same spot right because if you if you don't progress and everybody are you're falling behind so you have to you have to be on top of your game right yeah. you have a alice in wonderland quote i love maybe you can oh i that. yeah i totally love that one when 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 you remember there was a scene and she said that why we are running and staying in the same place she said well in our place we need to to run in order to stay in the same place if you want to go somewhere else, you need to run even faster, right? And and it was like a reflection for me, like exactly for the continuous improvement, because that's bang on. Like, you know what, if you stay in the place, if you don't develop, if you don't uh, progress, you are falling behind. Somebody will do it faster, somebody will do it better, and then your business is going down, right? And nobody wants it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, Sorry, Peter? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, I was thinking of different examples of that. Like one is like, um, I guess like Blockbuster, Netflix, Netflix before used to be like, you, you mainly DVDs you'd, you'd, you'd mail in and Blockbuster was starting to trying to do streaming, but they didn't really get into that. And then, uh, yeah, and then obviously now it's flipped where like Blockbuster, like went out of business and Netflix is, is like mm -hmm. one of these uh, uh, social media giants or uh, these streaming uh, companies. And, and like, and, and we, I, I think sometimes we, of the splashy stuff but like uh, i heard recently um i didn't look into it that domino's pizza their market or their uh, value of their shares is grew about the same as google from back like if you invested in, in domino's the same time when google started like both of them you'd have the same out we don't always realize domino's like i've heard just lots of random people over the last like five ten years how much they've improved the ingredients different things so uh it, that can help just some and sometimes you just need uh to do a bit more like you, you yeah you need to be faster than your competitors we don't have to be like twice as, like depending on your industry obviously you can be 10 percent mm -hmm. faster if you're at the top you get the reward um it's like uh an example um like in sports first place second place first place is you know sometimes 10 percent better like tiger woods uh, i can't remember there's an example i read about someone who's would get like fifth place a lot or less and tiger woods is like average is like less than two percent better but he's making 10 20 times as much money and aside yeah, from fine. so it, I, you, you need to Maybe if, okay. do you guys have two more minutes to wind things down? Yeah, sure. Fantastic. Well, uh, 
I always like to wind the show down uh, by getting a little bit more personal and human. We talk about work and leadership. We tried to talk about the future of work and leadership. I think today we tried to think about the future through the lens of the past. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also think that the future of work and leadership means uh, a, a little bit more uh, focus on the individual and our personalities and trying to, try to find a way to foster uh, ourselves as, as whole humans. And so mm -hmm. my hope is that I, I don't become completely fixated on only my work and I find I do better work when you know, I have strong relationships outside of the office and pursuits and hobbies and all the rest of it. So I'm curious about you guys, who you are outside of the office place. Uh, and maybe I can turn it to Ben. Uh, ben, who are you? What gets you excited? Where do your interests lie when when the, the quality assurance TQM hat comes off, when the business coaching hat comes off? Where does your mind turn? Uh, you know what? That's uh, maybe surprising. But um, at one point, I wanted to open a bakery. I'm like, uh, I, uh, I bake like sourdough breads uh, and I started to do it before it became mainstream uh, lately. Mm. Uh, and I really like to do it. I like to be outdoors. And uh, like my uh, uh, girlfriend, she, she mentioned like last on Canada Day, we've been on a hike at uh, White Shell. And she said, you know, have you noticed that how happy you are when you're outside? And I said, yeah, like, actually, I am like, I, well, to the point that maybe I need to guide somebody, right, you know, as a, as a, <laughs> as a hobby, because you still there is still a mindset of uh, how can I make my habit and, you know, turn it into a business. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, maybe like, you know, our, our Airbnb, like, you know, for guiding. But in general, like, I, I like life, I, I'm very grateful for whatever I have. And I try to smile a lot. And, uh, and you know what, People that know me out of the business, uh, they will know that I will pull a joke on uh, pretty much every occasion. <laughs> and I will excuse myself because I s translate some of my jokes. So probably the standards are uh, different. But you know what? After a couple of beers, it's, you know, leveling it up and then <laughs> having a good time. So I think I think out of the job, it's, it's, it's the same, I, you know. Awesome. Sounds Any good. big plans for the weekend? Are you going to get outside, out, outdoors? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This weekend, actually, I, I, I'm going like, we are going to rent a boat at Caddy Lake. Nice. I was planning to do it for a couple of years. One year it was flooded and uh, it was not accessible. The other year I had another excuse to not uh, do it. But this time I will do it. And uh, I already threatened my son. He's 13 years old. I said, okay, you're going to you know, to swim outside of the boat, trying to reach me and we will make turns and stuff like that. But anyways, so yeah, so I'm planning to do it on 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 one day on the weekend and the other day I'm going to prepare to my next week. Because again, you know, putting everything aside, uh, a good plan is a key to success. And I, you know, I have to plan my week ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. You know, mixed. Awesome. Well, we hope you enjoy Caddy Lake. Uh, and now on to you, Peter. Can you tell us a little bit about you when the data science, uh, you know, <laughs> stops for the day? What right. do you do when you're left to your own devices, when you're having fun, when you're pursuing your interests and hobbies outside of work? Where does where does Peter find himself? Uh, I have a lot, of, I guess, a lot of different uh, areas. Uh, some of them are more obvious than analytical, like I, I like doing escape rooms. I like playing strategy games, like tabletop games or certain video games. Uh, they're very complex. Uh, also, like sports, I haven't been active in sports the last couple of years, but I was very active um, back when I was younger in teenager years. I did a lot of different track and field events, played lots of soccer, indoor and outdoor. So I want to get back to that. Um, Do you um, hold yeah. some track and field records, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, yeah, I had <laughs> yeah back in junior high <laughs> some long some long jump long jump records for my uh, junior high school yeah uh, <laughs> so I want to yeah uh, no, I don't want to get back in track and field but I want to have yeah, in soccer actually I did archery a bit for my son uh, so I want to get back in some of that kind of stuff um, yeah as well uh, and uh, also also into uh, professional wrestling I like the because it's uh, the drama the uh, the spectacle because I'm also into superheroes and they're very much kind of like a real life superhero they do crazy feats, crazy, there's sometimes over dramatic storylines. And I, I also like the improv. I'm starting to start to, not that I want to get into comedy, but I just starting to appreciate comedy, um, the, the pace and especially the improv 
for me, because I'm very much a yeah, planner and very analytical, when people just seemingly out of nowhere come up with these great ideas and, and mm -hmm. jokes, stuff like that. So, uh, and, and wrestling's primarily improv. So uh, I, that feels to me. I also cool. very much into uh, wildlife. I actually, uh, like since I was a kid, I was studying encyclopedias about animals. And when I went to university, I had a side between uh, majoring in zoology or mathematics. And the reason why I went with math is because zoology, my favorite animal is mountain lions and there's none in Manitoba. So I was figured, oh, if I want to go study them, I'd have to uh, leave uh, Winnipeg and uh, I was starting to get serious with my girlfriend at the time. So eventually I did marry. So uh, yeah, so that's why like some people, that's kind of what anthropology is my minor because like zoology has, I, could, I didn't want to do a zoology minor because there's lots of labs, lots more time, but yeah. So uh, in my spare time, I wanted to help with data visualizations with uh, uh, well, the conservations because cool. it's helping track and proving their systems, their analysis, um, things like that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we hope you have a fantastic weekend. And I'd like to, to wrap Thanks. things up by saying thank you to all our audiences at home, wherever you may be. Uh, I think the three of us here on the show uh, all have a shared affinity for the outdoors uh, and yeah. maybe cherish our weekends a little bit. So hey, here's mm -hmm. from all of us here at Circle One. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, ben, so much for joining us. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a, a wonderful weekend uh, and are, we're all able to get a little bit of uh, fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good. All right. Thanks.